We are thankful that uh, you are our God and that you can do everything. Every time we have a question, every time we have a need, every time we have a doubt, you're the one who is uh, not only able to do it, but you always do everything well. You do it for our best. You do it to glorify your name. So, Father, we give back to you now of that which you've blessed us with. I pray, Lord, that you might allow our church to uh, meet the ministry needs and reach outside these walls and reach out into the community and world because of your name. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You may have heard this on Christian radio. Pretty popular song. One of my favorite new songs, I think, and I'm not sure, I didn't see the Grammys, but I think that Matt Redman won a Grammy for that song or one of the others that he just did. But it's, uh, it's one of those songs, the first time you hear it, go, wow, yeah, that's the way I feel. That's, that's the way I want to worship. Uh, this morning, I want to tell you, uh, before the end of the service, uh, we got to leave, like, <laughs> quick. So you may not see me around afterwards, and I know that's fine, but I didn't disappear. We're going to uh, a dramatic program that my uh, granddaughter, Julie, is doing, uh, Bailey is doing. Uh, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> I get her mixed up with Julie, which is our little ray of sunshine of our daughters, and she's kind of our little ray of sunshine in our granddaughters, and we got another ray of sunshine coming up. That's Naomi. And, you know, we, we're going to have another either granddaughter or grandson soon. Uh, our children are planning to adopt another one, so you can pray for them in that. Uh, this morning, we're going to uh, be starting a, a new series. Yeah, and I, uh, I want you to know that I don't have a particular passage for this one, but I want to take you to 1 Peter chapter 2, or pardon me, chapter 3, to get us started, because this is the issue right here. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Most of us as Christians could learn that gentleness and reverence part. But here's what I want you to see. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Do you know, folks, that we as Christians sometimes are uh, very inept at answering the questions that ought to be things that we know and understand. I came across, uh, actually it was done a few years back, but uh, another uh, research by George Barna. He's sort of the uh, Gallup poll of Christianity. And he says that basically the church today is biblically and theologically illiterate. And I think that's true. This church is probably the, the uh, church that I've been in that has the best biblical knowledge of all that I've ever pastored. And yet, uh, there are a lot of questions we have a tough time with too. And most of us just ignore these questions rather than answering them. He says that only 41% of American church attenders believe that the Bible is accurate in all that it teaches. That means that over 50% of people who are going to church out there don't believe that the Bible is, is really all that it claims to be. According to his research, he says only 33% of American church attenders believe they have a responsibility to share the gospel. I mean, that's the, the great commission of the church, and yet we've made it the great omission of the church. It doesn't matter if you think you ought to share the gospel. If you don't share it, it means you uh, either don't understand what Jesus said or you ignore what he said. Only 27% of American church attenders believe that the devil is a real being, at least until they have teenagers in the home. Uh, that 
Sorry, guys, that's, <laughs> that's enough to convince them. This morning I did a Marco Rubio and took a drink, but I thought I'd just get a cough drop this time. <laughs> Only 33% of American church attenders believe that salvation is by faith in Jesus alone. That one doesn't surprise me because people are always trying to add something to what God said. They, they want to put works in there, even though the Bible says that all of our works are as filthy rags. They're, they're, God isn't... Uh, He's not astounded by what we do. He believes that Jesus and what he did was enough. So I think, I think he's right. And only 40% of American church attenders that believe that Jesus lived a holy, sinless life. How could he be who he said he was if that's true? So all of those things say that we probably don't know the answers to the questions. And Peter said... If you claim to be a Christian, you should have some answers. But most of us are sort of like uh, answering questions the way our mamas used to answer our questions. You remember when you'd say to mama, why? And she would say, because. Because why? Because, just because. I don't know how many times I heard that one. And we as believers tend to think that when we answer people that way, it's faith. We just take it by faith. No, that's folly. Faith is not just a leap in the dark. Faith is not faith in faith, just believing something. Faith is that which is based on true fact and is real. And the world, when they ask us questions, they want to move beyond the because, and they want to ask the question, because why? Because why do you believe this? What is your reasoning? Why is this true or not true? So, this morning I want to open the answers arsenal. next few weeks, we're going to be looking into the arsenal, the place where at least a real arsenal is where you keep the weapons. Well, the weapons of our warfare are from God and from his word, and yet I think there are some questions that you need to know and understand. Think about it this way. If you were lying on an operating table and the last thing you heard the doctor say when you were going under is, uh, let's see, the hip bone's connected to the, uh, somebody bring me my notes I used to have in class. You know, you, you just go, <laughs> and then you're out. Uh, people expect us to have some answers. And so we're going to deal with that over the next few weeks. Came across this website I thought was interesting. I'm always looking to see out there what people believe and ask. And this 11 things the Bible bans, but you do anyway, caught my attention. Uh, this particular website is a very new age mystic sort of thing. But I thought, uh, well, we'll see what uh, kind of things they say the Bible bans. And so these are all their words. They say the Bible bans round haircuts. <laughs> See you in hell, Beatles, and or kids with bowl cuts or surfer cuts. Leviticus 19.27 reads, you shall not round off the side growth of your heads nor harm the edges of your beard. Did Leviticus say that? Yeah, I did. Hmm. What, what does that mean? They also say the uh, Bible bans football, at least the pure version of football where you play with a pigskin. Modern synthetic footballs are ugly and slippery anyways because Leviticus 11.8 says, which is discussing pigs, reads, you shall not eat of their flesh nor touch their carcasses. They are unclean to you. And that is what it says. The Bible bans fortune telling. They say before you call a 900 number, read your horoscope or crack open a fortune cookie, realize you're in huge trouble if you do. Why? Because Leviticus 19.31 reads, Do not turn to mediums or spiritists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. The penalty for that? 
I will also set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. And they, they say, seems like a lifetime of exile is a pretty harsh penalty for talking to the psychic ne network. Well, that's what Leviticus says. How about this one? Tattoos. Everybody out there better some of you cover up. Leviticus 19.28 says, You shall not make any cuts in your body for the dead, nor make any tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. And they say, Not even a little butterfly on your ankle? Or even, fittingly enough, a cross? That's what Leviticus says. The Bible bans polyester. That's right, polyester or any other fabric blends. The Bible doesn't want you to wear polyester, not just because it looks cheap. No, 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 it's sinfully unnatural. Leviticus 19.19 19 reads, You are to keep my statutes. You shall not breed together two kinds of your cattle. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor wear a garment upon you of two kinds of material mixed together. Check the tag on your shirt right now. Didn't you, re you didn't realize you were mid-sin at this exact second, did you? <laughs> That's what the passage says, though, folks, you know? Now, th the issue of all of this is that based on the questions and these answers, these folks, this man, I think it is, draws a conclusion. It is a conclusion that uh, people are discussing all over these days. You'll have to deal with this issue sooner or later. Here's their conclusion. If you're going to ignore the section of Leviticus that bans tattoos, pork, shellfish, round haircuts, polyester, and football, how can you possibly turn around and quote Leviticus 18.22 as irrefutable law, which says, you shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. And most of us couldn't give much of an answer on that one. And that is an excuse or at least a reason that people are using a lot as uh, pro-gay marriage. Questions, answers. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about. And I think I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, this guy is, uh, he's wacko. I mean, he's, I mean, th that's just wrong to ask questions like that. And yet some of you probably wondered about those issues yourself as we read through them. Because that is what Leviticus says. What do you do with things like that? How do you answer the questions that, that people ask? <laughs> Well, that's why we're going to open the answers arsenal. And we've got some answers to questions like these. So you'll want to stay tuned. For instance, what was God doing with all that time he had before creating us? You know, what, what was he doing? He, he, did he need us? Is that why he created us? And, and of course, that kind of question will allow us to answer questions about who God is and what he has done. And that's a very, very important question to ask and answer. Did Adam have a navel? Or did Eve have an extra rib? Uh, I know children ask questions like that, but when we ask that question, it's going to give us an opportunity to ask questions about creation what God did, when he did it, how he did it, and, and those are important questions to have answers to. How did God write us a letter if he has no hands? Oh, it's true, the Bible said, it talks about the hands of God and talks about him in what we call anthropomorphic terms, describing him as the way we describe us, but that kind of question will allow us to deal with the issue of the revelation of Scripture and, and what God has given us and whether or not it's true and all of this, this issue of the inerrant Word of God. Did Noah take two termites on the ark? Or how about a T-Rex? Well, I mean, that's a legitimate question. 
Uh, wh wh what would you answer on that? Well, it's not really that question that's so important as it is to answer questions about the flood and its effect on the earth and its effect on the whole issue of the date of the earth and so forth. Why does God hate shrimp? I mean, he outlaws it in Leviticus. And so we're going to talk about some of those Leviticus passages. All of those, those little nitpicky things. Why does God give commands like that? I mean, that really is an important issue. Questions about the purpose of some of those laws we'll try to answer. Since God is a God of love, what's wrong with Adam and Steve tying the knot? Because that is the big cultural issue before us today. You need to have an answer. I know that many of our young people, at least according to statistics, think those of us who teach that homosexuality is wrong, they think we're being mean. We're not thinking clearly. Well, let's think clearly and let's try to answer that question and really the question about God's purposes for the world and its inhabitants. How can God be all-powerful and all-loving in this suffering world? This is the, the question that is brought up again and again and again. If God is all-powerful and yet he's allowing suffering, then maybe he's not all-loving. Or maybe he's all-loving, but he can't do anything about those things, so he's not all-powerful. But if he's any of those things are not any of those things, he can't be God. So it's important to answer this issue of whether God can be good and still allow suffering in our world. What was Jesus' last name? We're going to talk about questions about the Savior of the world. Was he or was he just a man that sort of made a dent in history that had no really reason to be here? It's a good question and an important one. Now, you need to understand some things about this series that we're going through. Number one, I'm not going to try to be dealing with highly intellectual sort of issues. I don't have the ability to do that, quite honestly. My mind only goes, eh, you know, it's like one slice short of a full loaf sometimes. And so I will try to deal with these things for most of us, not for those of you who really think deeply. And so I'm trying to communicate to as many as possible, even our children who, who come into this service, so they can understand. So those of you who are really in-depth with your questions and your ability to think, this will maybe disappoint you, but I'll do my best. Uh, the question this morning that we're going to be dealing with won't answer all of your questions because I'm just introducing the issue. The issue about God and who He is and what He's doing. Um, the creator and sustainer of the universe, the architect of all things, that probably is an issue that we ought to start with. In order to deal with with this particular subject, I've been reading a couple of books. You may know one of these men. Richard Dawkins has appeared on uh, uh, Fox News several times. You may not have heard of uh, Sam Harris. But these men have written some best-selling books, basically building on and adding to the moral freefall that we have in our country. And as I was reading their books, I began to notice some characteristics about them. I thought it would be good to mention these as we get into the issue this morning. For instance, uh, in these books, both of these men prove exactly what I've been saying all these years about atheists. They are not really atheists. They are anti-theists. It's not that people like these are saying, no God. They're saying, no God. They don't like 
the idea of a God. They don't want a God. And, and you, you get that all through both of these books. In fact, Sam Harris, it's like he's got both arms fl flailing. He's just angry about God. Um, atheists can't find God for the same reason a criminal cannot find a policeman. They don't want to. Then I noticed a couple of, uh, really three things in these books. They're just things I noticed, but I want to point them out to you. Both of these books and both of these gentlemen, and I looked at several YouTube, uh, uh, ca uh, what do you call YouTube? Anyway, they're little film thingies. They both, <laughs> a film thingy, yeah. I told you this would not be highly intellectual. They both seem to have a few of the same characteristics. Number one, arrogance. They are very arrogant. Number two, anger. It just, it's, it's a seething anger in their writings. And strangely, sadness. Sadness with anger. It, I, I don't know why particularly I thought that as I was reading through it. But let's consider this, these issues a moment because I want to deal with these particular three thoughts and show you how many people who ask these questions and many people who deny God and many who think that science is the answer, they have these characteristics and you... And I should not have these characteristics. For instance, the issue of arrogance. You think about the Bible. It would say the most about God, you would think. But the Bible does not start out proving God. It doesn't. It just, it just assumes God. And it, it doesn't set out to prove the unprovable nor the indisputable. You cannot prove God. You were not there. You cannot prove evolution either. You were not there. There are other issues we have to talk about and answer, but the Bible just says, in the beginning, God doesn't go beyond that. Arrogantly... Paul deals with those who take that approach. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 25. Where, are, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, they can't find him. <laughs> they don't know where he is. They're not looking for him, really. Since the world in its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And yet, we as men try to one-up God. Yeah, I can figure him out. Yeah, real easy to do. There's an old Persian proverb that I learned when I was in pedagogy class, that is, teaching. Uh, the old Persian proverb says, he who knows not and knows that he knows not is a student. Teach him. But then the proverb goes on to say, He who knows not and knows not that he knows not is a fool. Shun him. Basically, that's what the book of Proverbs says. A fool responds this way. A fool is arrogant. A fool thinks God ought to answer him back. And then back in... Um, English class in the 11th grade, you would, you would think that none of us got anything out of English class, but I did get one or two things. And there was one particular uh, poem by Stephen Crane that just really stuck out to me. It was in my English literature book on this side of the page. And I remember the first time I read it, I thought, whoa, here's what he wrote. 
I met a seer, that is a wise person. He held in his hands the book of wisdom. Sir, I addressed him, let me read. Child, he began. Sir, I said, think not that I am a child, for already I know much of that which you hold. I, much. He smiled. Then he opened the book and held it before me. Strange that I should have grown so suddenly blind. In all of our arrogance to try to answer questions about God sometimes, we find ourselves falling over our own feet and tripping over our own tongues because he's far beyond anything we could say or think. A word to the wise. Number one, and I say this to those of you who are young especially, it's good to ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't even be afraid to ask questions about God and about the Bible. But if you're going to ask questions, be sure that you do your homework and find answers. And the answers, quite frankly, are not usually the easy ones. It's easy to come up at times with some simplistic answers, but they may not be the right answers. So do your homework. Study hard, ask the questions, learn the answers. Number three, even when you have answers, even when you get as smart as some of you are, and even when you know a lot, and even when you say, yes, I can read the book, be wise, but don't be a wise guy or gal. See, that's the one thing that you and I need to learn, even as we attempt to answer these questions over the next few weeks. Um, don't be arrogant. Uh, people deserve to ask questions, but the one who can answer them all, it's very difficult for them to even grasp for us to. Uh, number two, a thing that I saw in these guys is anger, a real seething anger. In fact, Sam Harris uh, connects all religions basically back to the terrorists. He says the men who committed the atrocities of September the 11th were certainly not cowards, as they were repeatedly described in the Western media, nor were they lunatics in any ordinary sense. They were men of faith, perfect faith, as it turns out. And this it must finally be acknowledged is a terrible thing to be a person of faith. Do you see how he just sort of lumped everything together and therefore we people of faith are, we're horrible people. Don't get me wrong, I, I can be pretty angry too when I think about religions and the way they have... Uh, the, the things they've done in the world. For instance, the Crusades. In the name of Jesus, going around and killing people and, and thinking that was good. No, I hate that. And I, I hate it that that was done under the name of the church or the Inquisition. Listen, I'm all for... Um, knowing biblical issues and, and not accepting heresy, but the murders that went on in the name of the church, bad stuff. And, and the wealth and arrogance that have piled up in the church when people are going hungry. And the, the things that some churches have done to people and putting the, the same kind of burdens on their backs that the Pharisees did to the people in their days. I hate those things. And I, I hate the way some of you who have been uh, hurt by churches. And I hate the way I'm lumped in with all of the other Fred Phelpses and terrorists. And I, I hate that. I also hate the fact that Satan uses that. Uses religion. Uses all of these horrible things to make us all look bad so that he can turn people away from God. In fact, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, lest the light of the glorious gospel of God should appear to them. That's what he's, I hate that. 
that he's pushing religion so that people miss out on the relationship with God that they could and, and should have. But I don't blame God for it. It seems silly to blame God for the things that you and I do. And yet many books are written blaming God for what people have done. And then number three, the sadness. I, I read through these books and I go, these guys are sad. It just doesn't seem to fit sadness, and yet they're so angry and they're so arrogant, but there's a, a sadness in their writings. I thought that maybe it was just me. And then a couple of weeks ago, I was reading uh, Ravi Zacharias's book, The End of Reason. Do, do any of you recognize that name? Any of you? A few. Uh, Ravi Zacharias is a, an apologist. He is a Christian who, who is good at answering the questions. And in his book, he said this, and I thought, oh, I think I got it right. He said, as I read Sam Harris's books, I felt as though I was being dragged through a vortex of emotion from incredulity to outrage to a deep sadness. And I thought, yeah, that's what I saw, deep sadness. And then Ravi goes on to talk about his testimony. And I did not know the story of his life. All you need to do is look at him. You can tell he came from India, somewhere over there. Or India, I'm not sure where, but uh, he has a background, and he gives his testimony. He goes on to say this, contrary to what atheists imply, the dead weight of their beliefs leads to a heartless, pointless, and hollow existence. They can ask all the questions. <laughs> they just don't have any answers. He says Friedrich Nietzsche, one of Sam Harris's predecessors in the promotion of atheism over belief in God, described existence without God. In such a world, Nietzsche said, we stray through an infinite nothing, with no up or down left. And if you know anything about Friedrich Nietzsche, you know that he spent the last 13 years of his life in a mental insanity state, his mom there by his bed until he died. Uh, it led to nothing. Lots of questions, no answers. Ravi goes on to explain his own life. He explains how sadness comes from atheism, and then he turns from that to talk about his two friends. See, he was an atheist. His two friends were atheists. They took their own lives, and Ravi Zacharias says this, it was my turn to commit suicide. That, that's where he was headed. It was my turn, a botched attempt in which I ended up in a hospital room in New Delhi with doctors battling to keep me alive. It was in that lowly condition that I was handed a Bible and the story of the gospel was read to me. All I can say now is how grateful I am that Sam Harris was not my mentor for my life would have ended there and then. Instead, I trusted the Christ of the Scriptures, and today, four decades later, having traveled this globe dozens of times, speaking in numerous countries and lecturing in scores of universities, I find Jesus to be more beautiful and attractive than ever before. Yeah, I would say the same. And I hope you can say the same. Listen, guys. Before we close the doors to the answers arsenal this week, I want you to remember one thing. These words of Jesus in John 10, verse 10. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I like one of the paraphrases, how it puts it, although I don't recommend paraphrases. I think it was J.B. Phillips who said, I came that you might live. I mean, really live. And it's the person who has all the questions but none of the answers who is not living, 
who is not finding the very meaning that you and I could and should have in Jesus Christ. And that's what I want you to find. I want you to bow your heads with me. Father, I pray this morning that you might just begin to help us answer some of the very questions that plague our minds. Father, we know from your word that we can't really understand any of these things without the Holy Spirit living within us. The natural man, the unsaved person, the person without God can't understand, does not. So I pray, Father, if any of my friends are here this morning who have not understood the gospel, let them know, Lord, that you sent your son to die in their place, that none of their good works can save them. Jesus only paid the price. He alone can give them eternal life. I pray, Father, that anyone who is here who doesn't have him in their lives, they might say this morning, God, save me. Help me to understand. Help me to, to understand that Jesus can give me real meaning in my life because I want him to be my Savior. Father, for those of us who've trusted the Lord Jesus, I pray that you might give us a further understanding of how to answer all the questions that are out there. We pray in Jesus' name.